So, uh, Lawrence, we've been playing go-kart Mozart tunes for as long as you've existed. Uh, so why the change to Mozart Estate? Yeah, I wanted to do a more serious name for a more serious time, really. And go-kart Mozart was meant to be a very quick turnaround, like three albums, really quick and then move on to something else and um, kind of real life got in the way and it staggered on. So um, I think Mozart Estate is a better name, really, for, right, for okay. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. obviously go-kart Mozart's got the connotations of Blinded by the Light anyway, hasn't mm. it? So, um, But I also read that you, um, you, you did uh, coin the phrase the world's first B-side band. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, after um, I left EMI, I thought... Um, it was very hard to um, sort of break through, you know, go in the studio, you've got to come up with a hit single. It was a lot of pressure all the time. And I wanted to do something that was very um, easy to to approach. And that's kind of the way you do a B-side. You kind of go in and you don't... Um, you, you, care, you get a great song, but you don't... Um, you kind of reel it off really quickly. Yeah, the the expectation isn't there, is it? As it was with the A side. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, exactly. They're not like B side songs because they're inferior. It's nothing to do with that. It's right. it's the way you present them. It's the way you record them and present them. Is it more kind of? Um, it's more laid back in the studio, yeah. Right, OK. I mean, you're talking there, in a way, about pressure. And, of course, you know, we first met when you were in Felt and you opened on a few occasions for the mm. fall and we got to know each other just a little bit. And we were both youngsters at the time. Mm. Um, but there was pressure on you then because the, the great reviews were coming through and everything. And, of course, Felt eventually just broke up and then you moved to Denham. But um, you've, you've said you're very vocal about not reforming either Denham or Felt. Uh, why, 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 why do you say that? Do you just want to move forward? Is that is that the point? I want to move forward, and I dislike as a fan um, bands when they break up and then they get back together again. It, it's really annoying. Um, I remember when Status Quo split up and <laughs> they played like Wembley Stadium and made a live album and a DVD and made everyone buy everything, and then a year later they were back on the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's true. It's really annoying. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, you know, because a lot of bands learn the lesson from the bands like Status Quo, and they don't split up, they go on a hiatus, which could be a year, two years, ten years, but when they come back, it's not a bit like when you come back to a party an hour after having left already. It's like, oh, we were only on hiatus, we'd never split up, so... Well, uh, I don't mind that, actually, because um, I think if you say, we're going away for a year, we're going on a holiday, Roxy Music used to do it, and... We all accepted it. It was like, OK, they're going away for a couple of years. Brian's yeah. doing a solo album. And when they get back together, it, it's fine. I think as long as you don't say, we're splitting up and there's a great big hoo-ha. Yeah. And I think once you've done it, to go back is... Well, I, I'd, I'd rather work in a coffee shop, to be honest. Right, OK. Than reform one of the old bands. Fair play to you, mate. And so, um, I have to ask you this question. Are you aware of how influential Felt were? Um... Gosh, not really. A lot of people say this band sounds like felt. That band, um, I'm not sure to be honest. I think that you, I think you were a template for so many bands that followed you. And you know, and I will include, and people mm. might shout at me. I'd include the Smiths in there, and I know Johnny Johnny Marr is a fan of the band as well. Um, and and you are actually at the helm of um, some reissues, aren't you? Of Felt's back catalogue. Yeah, we've got the whole ten albums reissued on Cherry Red. And the um, first five, there's five of them on Cherry Red, five of them were on Creation. They're now all available. And I want, I must say that um, you should buy the CD boxes because they're in a seven inch box and they're beautiful. And they've got seven inch single, big posters, lots of ephemera. And um, I think people should go out and buy them for sure. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what, I did also read, and I need to credit Ryan Gilby here, who did a great interview with in in the Guardian. But um, there was a quote about you which I loved when people say that they listen to your music on Spotify, and you say, "Well, buy the bloody record," and they say, "I haven't got a turntable," and you say, "Put it on the bloody wall." Uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> I get people coming up to me in the street and saying, "Gosh, I love felt, I love them," and I say, "What do you listen to it on?" You know, and they say um, Spotify, and that's when I get. You know, that's when I tell them. Yeah, doesn't fair. matter if you haven't got a record player. You can just the sleeves are so beautiful. You could put them on the wall. They're artifacts, aren't they? 
Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Do you know, uh, we played um, one of the songs off your album, which mm. we need to say, Pop Up Kaching and the Possibilities of Modern Shopping. Uh, we'll uh, play... and, um, oh, sorry, Mark. You're right, oh, mate, I was on. just going to say, we've got a do at Rough Trade on Friday night, Rough Trade East, if you live in London or you live around the edges. Um, come down to Rough Trade. We're going to get as many people there as possible. And I'm signing the album and I'm doing a, a talk with Ted Kessler. Um about the album, and we talk about felt as well, so, uh, you know, no st- stone unturned. Wow, fabulous. OK. I mean, I was going to ask you about this, because I don't know who came up with the idea, but it was a really unique and, and, and novel idea. Uh, but to just kind of put some coffers in your pocket before the record started selling and the tour and all that, you did the big Broadway market book sale in November, didn't you, where you didn't sell, you didn't sell kind of like signed photographs of yourself. You signed or you stamped um, your favourite books from your collection and sold them. How did that go? Yeah, it went really well. What What's happened is I've got a massive collection of books and haven't got enough space in the flat so I got I put about um, a quarter of it on sale and they're all rec- books that I've read but I've kind of a lot of them superseded with mint edition so you'll get in the very first edition that I read and what I did was I put a blurb on the front of each one a big post-it note saying why I like this book or something about the book and then we rubber stamped it with Lawrence's library which I stamp all my books with. Fabulous. Just what? So that when I'm dead, someone will come in my flat and see all these books with my stamp, and then they'll start selling on. Because you can buy things like Truman Capote's library and um, people like that. I've, I've got a book from a guy from Oz. So there's a big market in stamped books by famous people. Right, well, I didn't know that. And there was also the Looking for Lawrence, which is, I'll read here, is a folder packed with a series of clues as to who he actually is, limited edition of 500 only, 150 signed and numbered. And so it sounds like, you know, you've got some kind of, um, you've got some traction going there with, with just trying to monetize what people want to get from you. Well, what we did was a folder, um, which has never been done before, full of ephemera, a seven-inch single with a track that will never be on any other physical release. Um, Posters, everything like that. And um, simply, I wanted to make it an event at the bookshop, so that's why I sold some of my books as well, so that people weren't just walking in and seeing a folder. wanted to have the whole bookshop um, packed with stuff. But the folder was the main issue, really, Um, because I'm not online and I don't do, like, I don't sort of feel myself as I'm walking around or anything like that. So, so the idea was you can't really... Who is he really? You know, what's he all about? So we put it in a folder. Right. And you can buy it from... Um, we've got a website called Lawrence Land, which is just for buying things. Yeah, it's, it's Lawrence-Land. No, no UK, it's, it's... Yeah, but it's Lawrence Land as well. We, we've brought Lawrence Land. We had a bit of trouble with right. the dash. We had to put a dash in for a little while, but we've secured the name Lawrence Land now. So it's like Poundland, you know what I mean? Yeah, brilliant. OK. And so, um, I mean, talking about getting to know you, I mean, you are an enigma. And, like, if somebody just emailed in and said that they bumped into Brett Anderson from Suede, and, and this person, I'll, I'll try and find the email in a bit, said uh, to Brett Anderson, who would you most like to interview if you could just interview anyone? And he said Lawrence, you know. And so, but it was the DVD, the documentary, Lawrence of Belgravia, that, that opened up your world to many people didn't it? Yes, it did, because I think people were finally able to recognise me, and I wore a distinctive uniform, kind of, all through the film. (laughs) I kind of wore one thing, really, all the way through it, and everything was in storage, you see. And um, people kind of, oh, yeah, that's what he looks like, Okay. I mean, just coming here tonight, I was lost, and um, I got off the tube, I thought, well, where am I? Gosh, God, where am I? And I said to this woman, do you know where Maida Vale is? And she went, are you Lawrence? Yeah, of course you So, did. and that was in the dark. <laughs> well, that's fair. You've arrived, mate. And you mm. were fa- thankfully, you arrived at Maida Vale as well. So we're getting this fab- fabulous session off you. And so the dates I've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five dates here, which is what we could get off Tinternet. I don't know if you've got more mm. lined up than that. Yeah, well, if you go to a website called Mozart Estate, because Lawrence Land is for buying, Mozart Estate is for sort of perusing, you know, having a look yeah. at what's going on. And there's a guy who does it for me. And um, all the dates will be on there. So we're playing about six in March. And really, we're playing for a year. We're going on for a year. Brilliant. And we're trying to play all 
crazy places in the world. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be out and about. Great. Well, I'll tell you what, I will read the dates that I've got here in front of me, which is just as I say, but the 3rd of March, Brighton, the Albert, uh, Albert the 12th, Leeds, Sunnybank Mills, the 16th, Glasgow Stereo, the 17th, uh, that will be in Newcastle upon Tyne, the Cumberland Arms, the 30th of March, the Boston Music Room in London. We might be missing some, but we'll remedy that some way or another. And I'm so grateful uh, to you all for coming in and playing for us tonight. It's such a treat. And, uh, and what are you going to do next for us? So we're going to do a song off the new album. <clears throat> which is out on Friday, pop up kitchen and the possibilities of modern shopping, and this is called Before and After the Barcode. Brilliant. Okay.